All right. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, everyone, anyone else who joins us can trickle in here quietly, but we'll get underway to respect everybody's time. Thanks so much for coming out. My name is Corey Redderkop. I'm the CEO with the Greater Langley Chamber of Commerce. If you're not familiar with what the heck a Chamber of Commerce is, we are Langley's largest business association, representing over 1,100 member businesses across the township and the city. We are a private, non-government, non-partisan, not-for-profit, which exists to serve and support our members uh, and Langley business. So we feel it's important to create opportunities for our members and the broader community, I know many of you aren't, aren't, aren't engaged with the chamber, but to create opportunities for the broader community to come and uh, engage with candidates seeking all levels of government office. We do these for uh, every level of election that we have. So we appreciate you being here as attendees and to the candidates for taking the time to be here as well. Uh, before we get started, I do want to recognize that we are on the traditional territories of the Kwantlen, Matsqui, Keitsi, and Semiamu First Nations, and all the work of the chamber happens on these uh, lands, and we appreciate that opportunity. I do want to make a, special, uh, a few special remarks or thank yous to uh, some key organizations. Uh, first, I want to do a big thanks to uh, KPU for hosting us here tonight. Uh, they're a tremendous asset to have here in Langley. Um, they're educating the thousands of our next generation of workers and innovators and, and business leaders. So uh, thank you. I think Harbeer's here. Thank you, Harbeer, and all your team for helping us uh, put on the event tonight. And I want to recognize that they've got a bunch of cool swag out front, so make sure you grab it from them on your way out. Uh, our partners, they always partner us with us on our All Candidates events because they're, they're, uh, they're also uh, similarly civic-minded. Uh, the Fraser Valley Real Estate Board, they're an association of 5,000 real estate professionals who live and work here in Langley, but across North Delta, Surrey, White Rock, Abbotsford, and Mission, and, and work to support and grow the industry. So uh, thanks to them for their support in, in helping us put on this event. Um, speaking of them, I wanted to just maybe pass the mic over for a few moments to Sonny Hundle, who's a board member with the Fraser Valley Real Estate Board, to say a few words on behalf uh, of, of them. Sonny? Oh, he stepped out. We'll get Sonny, we'll get Sonny in here at, in a sec. Perfect. Well, <laughs> thank you, Sonny. Um, but thank you all very much for joining us today. And, and for those of you, we are recording this. For those of you watching back, I hope the future as well, and uh, you're here watching this on the recording. Uh, for a bit of housekeeping, um, if for some reason you need, to, you need to exit, you obviously came in that way. If an emergency, there's also emergency exits on this side to my right. Um, washrooms, if you need those, are located back into the foyer and to the left, and you'll find them there uh, as well. Uh, today's event is meant to create a platform to hear from the candidates and the upcoming provincial election. Tonight we're focusing on candidates seeking the office of MLA in the writings of Langley Walnut Grove and Langley Willowbrook. And next week on October 2nd, we're going to be having another session to hear from the candidates in the Langley Abbotsford writing. For tonight, the chamber invited every candidate who has publicly announced they were running or had registered with Elections BC. We issued these invitations several weeks ago and we're happy to have several candidates joining us today. We do not have all the candidates here, um, so given that, we have adjusted tonight's format to make use, the best use of our time and the candidates' time and your time uh, to make sure that we get uh, interesting conversations. So um, for each of the candidates, we'll, and you'll be wondering what the heck is going on with the seats here, for each of the candidates, we're going to be doing one-on-one -on -one interviews and sitting down with a series of questions that we would have asked as a panel, but we'll be taking the time to sit with them one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Those questions are going to be drawn from the categories of the cost of living and doing business, jobs in the economy, housing and infrastructure, and community health and safety. Um, all month long, the Chamber's been accepting questions on our webpage, uh, uh, the webpage we have for this event, and we've received several, so thank you for those. Um, some uh, were great, and we're going to ask them as is. Uh, some kind of clumped around comment, top, top, common topics or themes, uh, which we've woven those together into, into questions that kind of captured a bunch of the different questions that we received. Uh, tonight is a, dis a chance to have a discussion with the candidates. We will give them the chance to answer questions or not answer the questions, and we'll hopefully glean information that you voters can use as we approach October 19th. Uh, before we start, I'd like, to take the, uh, to I'd like to thank the candidates for putting their names forward and running. It is not an easy task. I have been around many campaigns. Um, it's, it's a lot of hard work, um, but it is essential for the functioning of our democracy. Uh, we take it for granted that we're just going to have elections, but without uh, candidates, there are no elections. So everyone who stands and should be recognized and respected for that contribution. Um, so yes, I, I agree, I agree. So speaking of respect, I'd like to ask for your respect during the, discuss the discussions tonight. If you disagree with a candidate on an issue, you have never had more options to make that voice heard on social media, volunteering, putting up a sign, donating, and voting. voting. Uh, shouting and booing should not be among those options. Um, I just don't think that will be productive. So let's have, a, I hope we can have a, a good discussion here. The candidates uh, that are here will be sharing their thoughts on stage. I'm sure they won't be racing out of here as soon as they're done. I'm sure you can probably grab a moment with them afterwards. Um, and, uh, but uh, let's just keep this uh, civil. So uh, let's get underway. 
Each candidate will have up to two minutes for an opening statement and introduction before we dive into the questions. We've set aside about 20 minutes for the question portion. My colleague Bernice will be giving us a little reminder. There we go. <laughs> of uh, when those two minutes are up, and, and in the 20-minute portion, every, every two minutes so we can kind of stay on track. We'd like to be able to move, move along and cover more ground and have a, a number of questions covered. Um, and then every candidate will have a chance to wrap up with the two-minute uh, closing remarks. So we're going to start with uh, tonight with the writing of Langley Walnut Grove. Uh, this is the writing roughly north of 72nd, north of Highway 10, there's 196 on, on, on the west and kind of going to about 240th on the, on the east, including Fort Langley. Uh, so if you're kind of north Langley, this will be your writing. Um, so to start us off, I'd like to invite uh, Megan Dykeman, candidate with BC NDP, to join me on stage. Oh, thanks, Corey, and uh, thanks everyone for, for having me here today. It's, it's truly an honor to be here, um, and, and an absolute privilege. I'd like to uh, start off by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territories of the Kualan, Katsi, Matsqui, and Semiamin nations, and um, just very grateful for um, the opportunity to live, work, and play here, and uh, the um, excellent relationship we have with all of the nations in this area. I'd like to thank uh, the other candidates who have come out tonight, uh, Andrew Mercier, who uh, is um, running in the other Langley riding, and um, as well as Petrine Arneson. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, it's really just an honor to have the opportunity to run for re-election in uh, the riding of Langley Walnut Grove with the BC NDP. So thank you for, for having us here today, Corey. Awesome. Well, no, well thank, thank you very much for being here. Um, we did have, we, we, would you want to use this time, more, any more time as your opening remarks? That was pretty, kind of kicked us off to a good Absolutely. start. Absolutely. I mean, just wanted to just say that, you know, the last four years have been a privilege um, serving in this area, and we've done so much work together. Um, all of the people who live in this community, um, I've had the opportunity to get to know so many of you. I've had the opportunity to raise my two children here. I've been a farmer in this area for over uh, 20 years, and I had the privilege of serving as a school trustee for three terms. And um, during that time period, I uh, became so passionate about public service in this, in this area. It's, a, it's actually a distinct pleasure to be able to give back to such a, a wonderful community. In the time that I've been here um, serving as MLA over the last four years, we've built over uh, 3,000 new school spaces um, in our fast-growing community. We know that people want to move here. They want to raise their families here. But you need more infrastructure. We've seen the start of the freeway expansion. We have seen the addition, um, or the announcement of the addition of 300 new long-term care spaces because we know that as our population is aging, um, we need to have all um, availability of all different levels of care. We have seen our nonprofits who deliver such vital services in our community receive um, funding through uh, the uh, growing, um, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the nonprofit um, community fund. So it's been a great four years. We've done a lot of work. Awesome. Well, thank, thanks again very much for being here, and let's, let's dive into our questions. So um, we've got 20 minutes for this portion, and Bernice will let us know when two minutes goes by, so maybe we can try to keep an, a, rough, a rough plan on those, well, those questions, but this is, this is your time for the discussion. So and, uh, uh, Bernice will be digging us, digging us off as we go here. But uh, the number one issue that we hear from our members, we just did a survey in, in, uh, in June, is uh, the cost of doing business. Obviously, we're businesses, but the cost of living, affordability, is that's, that's top of mind. Um, I think everyone here can, can feel the pressure of the increased cost of living from gas to groceries to rent, having to stretch Page, stretch paychecks further. What do you want to do? What would you do as an MLA with four more years? What do you want to do to address the cost of living and help people with general affordability? Yeah, thanks for that question, Corey. And yeah, up on the doorsteps and in the community, what, what I hear about is sort of three broad areas, cost of living, um, housing, health care, and in Langley very much education. And uh, it is a challenge. We, we've had over the last four years um, so many uh, challenges that we've dealt with. We've come out of a pandemic. We've seen climate-related um, you know, disasters. We have seen global inflation increase the pressure on families. And uh, in the four years that, that I've served as MLA, we have worked to lower the cost of living for families through very sort of measurable steps. So for instance, with seniors, we've increased the safer rate. Um, we have the renter's tax credit. We've seen the family benefit. Uh, we have worked to 
you know, build businesses in, in the community so that there's good paying jobs closer to home. We've seen ICBC rates um, go down dramatically for, for most drivers. Those very measurable steps are just a few of the examples we've taken. But what I know that our government is committed to doing is continuing to address individual families, lowering their costs through, through measurable steps while continuing to grow the economy. Our economy in British Columbia is the top one per GDP in all of Canada because people want to live and work here. So opening up, strengthening the economy, supporting families, those multifaceted approaches are what's going to allow families to feel the relief because that problem is a global problem. But here in British Columbia, those steps are being taken and, and we're starting to see the uh, fruits of our labor in that area. I, I want to pick up a little bit on that because you, you mentioned obviously what you've what uh, you've done for uh, people, um, obviously we represent businesses. So for our, in our perspective, paid sick leave, a new stat holiday, the employer health tax, paid transparency legislation, BC labor code changes, there's been a lot of burden put on uh, and taxes put on businesses by the provincial government. Um, what, can get, what can businesses expect from a re-elected NDP government and, and what's, what do you speak, how do you speak to the, the right balance between um, affordab affordability measures for residents and people versus employers and job creators? That's a fantastic question and, and it is an interesting and it's a very wide, complicated area, but it's one of my most favorite conversations. I know we've talked about this quite a lot, Corey. Our government has, has um, an understanding that absolutely businesses need the environment to, to grow and to, to realize profits. And measures for individual folks that are, that are paying um, you know, their, their bills and they, they have to go to work, they need to be able to live too or else you're going to have an employee. Uh, employee shortage. What we have done is we recognize that really taxes, either taxes go up or you increase investment in the province, but one way or another those expenses have to be paid. So we've worked with businesses. An example would be the BC Manufacturing Jobs Fund. Over seven million dollars for businesses um, in the Lower Main Loan alone. One of them is right here in Langley, Cloverdale Fuels, who received over eight hundred thousand dollars to adapt um, and repair equipment. And if you think about that business's support, they employ people who work there, but also all of the people that use Cloverdale Fuel's yard to keep waste out of, out of the um, dump and create um, you know, value-added products. All of the people who use that yard are also employed. So looking at targeted investment for businesses to support the adoption of new technology, to expand and also attract new businesses like the um, lithium ion battery plant, um, $1 billion in Maple Ridge. When you encourage investment into the province, you increase the province's revenue. So looking at the full spectrum of how can you grow your economy while supporting people, people who go to work every day, growing the economy by incentivizing investment, and then further supporting businesses to adopt with new technology is sort of a multi-pronged approach that needs to be taken, in my opinion. The, so mentioning uh, uh, Cloverdale Fuel or mentioning the, the, the ion battery, these, these are going to be jobs that require, a lot of them will be prior skills or reskilling. We're sitting here tonight at KPU. Um, the workforce is changing and quickly. New skills are needed all the time. How will you as MLA and, and your party support education and skills training to ensure the people of Langley can access these new jobs? There's, there's no point in creating a big new plant if the people in Langley can't work there. Oh yeah, that's, that's a really exciting question. I, I'm sure that um, my, my colleague and counterpart is sitting over there thinking, I wanted that question because um, Andrew had started a lot of that work with skilled, skilled trades. Um, we've worked really closely with KPO. We are so fortunate to have the relationship we have with KPO. The programs with the Workforce, tax, uh, workforce Skilled Trade Tax Credit up to $3,500 for a grant for acquiring skilled, uh, skilled trades. Um, all of the other programs and the recent commitments we've made to expanding the number of skilled trade um, job training opportunities uh, are, are being, uh, I, I can't remember the exact number, but it was tens of thousands of people who have come out and, and had the opportunity to upgrade their skills um, through these grant programs, allowing employers to be able to access a skilled um, employee in that area. We know that that was a problem for so many years. And that's why these programs were brought in. And there's a commitment to continue those into the future. Because as you said, technology is rapidly changing. 
and the need for a skilled workforce is something that, that um, our government recognizes is absolutely essential. Uh, th thanks for that. I, I want to move over into our housing and infrastructure category, and um, and obviously Langley is one of the is the fast, second fastest growing community in, in in the province now, I believe. And much has been made of the province's new housing legislation and the restrictions or, or, or changes it puts in place for local governments. Uh, what role do you think local government should play in housing development, and how will you work with municipalities like the township to streamline development processes, overcome obstacles uh, and challenges, and, and obtain buy-in to what your plan is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our housing is a, is a top priority um, for, for our government. We have, through different programs like BC Builds and Housing Hub, we've seen the addition of over 1,000 new units in the township alone. Um, the Township of Langley uh, put through forward three, three projects for the recent BC Builds announcement that was made, um, providing attainable housing for, for people in our community. Municipalities play an, an essential role in this. I mean, when you look at um, they, they play a role in planning, they play a role in what that looks like, what offsets are like, um, you know, ensuring that there's, um, you know, the infrastructure needed in, in a growing community. And the partnership between the province through programs like BC Builds with, um, with councils who, who really are so excited about the opportunity to build housing that people can afford so they can live closer to their work is something that is really exciting, and seeing a thousand new units coming to Langley is is a significant um, is a significant investment. Do you have any, any comment on how you balance, or what you, you, you how you would want to see government balance this question of, of housing affordability versus equity? So obviously, many people in the room here might be homeowners, and to make housing affordable, you have to bring the price down. Um, do you have any comment on how we balance between people who have their retirement? savings in their home and the next generation that wants those homes to be cheaper? That's a great question, absolutely. Um, you know, when you look at, when, when I think about the question that you just asked, thinking about that equity, I think that's achieved through a, a variety of different housing opportunities. So, you know, from apartments to um, small farms, like as a farmer myself, I'm, I'm, I'm on a few acres and um, I know lots of people who, especially who have community jobs, they, they prefer something that is, would be like an apartment or a condo closer, say, to a freeway network. I think that you achieve that, that equity and opportunity through that OCP process that councils go through, building a range of housing to meet the different needs and stages that, that people have in their lives. Um, so this is housing and infrastructure, and, and you're writing... Um is cut through by one of the biggest pieces of infra infrastructure we have in the right uh, in the in Langley, which is Highway One. Um, businesses and computers they're stuck in traffic on Highway One daily. That means workers can't get to their jobs on time. Deliveries can't get to stores on time. We have stories where, where plumbers and HVAC technicians have to do fewer jobs during the day because they can't get to them all. Um, what's your position on the Highway One expansion, and, and are you satisfied with how the project's been delivered so far? That's a great question. I mean, the Highway One expansion that has been a, a very long time uh, that, that there had been a conversation about that and, and the previous government had committed to expanding it and it, it, it wasn't expanded and then we started the expansion and then we had challenges with um, you know, the atmospheric river. Um, in the middle of that you had a pandemic. Uh, it was sort of the, all of the possible things that could happen as you were expanding the freeway happened. Given the breadth of circumstances that we were dealing with, I, I'm, I'm very impressed with the, the progress that's being made. But during that progress, you are going to see um, you know, a slowing of traffic, and it's frustrating. But I know that when the freeway is finished, uh, it'll be nice for people to get to their home, to their families faster. But during construction, there is always that lull of, uh, and backup. And... and We've just, we, there was just announcements for uh, another two point something billion for getting the highway out to, to, to the mission in, uh, connection. Um, but we're, both these projects are many years in the future. Do you have any comment on, on, the, on the infrastructure that your government's been putting in place and, and the timelines and budgets with them? I mean, we know we've seen the, uh, I mean, an increase in, in infrastructure project uh, costs um, in line with, with other inflationary pressures. Infrastructure is essential. And... Um, it's uh, unfortunate that, that we're, there was a very long period of time where there wasn't any infrastructure investment. Previous, previous governments just didn't. 
we are now catching up while also expanding. And um, although the pro projects are, are costly and we, our government works diligently to ensure there's a wide range of different infrastructure opportunities in addition to the freeway, you also have the SkyTrain. Um, they're, they're necessary investments so that people get home to their families, so that people can move goods around, so that businesses have the opportunity to participate in interprovincial trade, things that are, that are vital. Um, and uh, you know, our government's committed to putting in the infrastructure that, that people need in this province. Great, thank you. Um, I want to move into our, our community health and safety category. Um, Langley, as I mentioned earlier, is the fastest growing community in Metro Vancouver. And I was doing a little bit of research ahead of this, and, and um, that comes with growing pains, particularly in healthcare. And, and I, was, uh, I saw that Langley's got uh, lower than the, av the national average for hospital beds per population. Um, and with the number of people moving to Langley, we're going to keep falling to less than one bed per thousand without further investment in the hospital. Um, what would you do as MLA to fight for and address uh, the health care needs in our community? Oh, thank you for that question. And um, health care is, is essential. It's, it's one of the core things that, that we need as a community. We need education, a robust education system. We need a health care system that works for people. And those investments have been taking place during the last four years. We've seen expansion of the emergency room. We have seen um, the expansion of the hospice. We have seen investments of imaging, like MRIs and um, CTs. We've seen um, these investments going into a very fast-growing community. Uh, we recently announced 300 long-term care beds. Uh, these investments are, are absolutely essential. And we have seen, provincially, 800 more net doctors hired, too. Um, and, and it feels like it's not happening quickly, but, it's ma but these investments all add up to providing more infrastructure, health infrastructure in our community. We've also expanded the urgent primary care center um, into Langley. We will be expanding it in the new location near, up near the Walmart area to have longer hours and more space, more doctors. It's about having a wide range of services available. In, in the hospital, um, definitely, is so important to invest in, but you also need to invest in matching people up with doctors so they can get that primary care at home. Having options for people to access an urgent primary care center for something that's urgent but doesn't need to go to the hospital. You need to have long-term care so that people who are, who are, not, are not able to go home, they still need time to get better, aren't sitting in an emergency room where somebody else is trying to come in with a cardiac situation. So it's about the gamut of it. So when we've looked as MLA, when I, in, in my role when I was MLA for Langley East, I would advocate for that full range after meeting with doctors and nurses and hearing what we need in our community, which is a wide range of care. Uh, thank you for that. You, you mentioned your um, history as a school trustee. Um, did you want to comment on Again, Langley, with the, with the growth we're seeing in south of the Fraser, Surrey's had this problem for this challenge for, for since I went there, a generation of, of portables and, and challenges there. Do you want to comment on, on, on are you satisfied with your government's response to grow, building schools, making sure that we have spots for, for students in Langley? My favorite subject. Yes, absolutely. I'd like to comment on that. Thank you. So yeah, our, um, our I, I had the distinct honor of serving as, as a school trustee for three terms. My last term, I served as chair, and education is something that, that I'm so passionate about. And I remember sitting on the board for 16 years watching government fight with teachers instead of investing in the community, going to court instead of building schools we needed to build, and ordering the sale of lands instead of you know, planning ahead. In this time, in seven years, we've seen 5,000 new spots in Langley, 3,000 in the last um, four years. We've seen new schools announced, a new middle, high school, multiple elementary schools. We've seen them open. We have seen not only new schools announced, but we've seen the expansion of new schools through modular construction. Um, when you go, get a chance to drive by one of these schools, they're absolutely stunning because we know that we don't just need more schools, we need more school space more quickly. We need it fast. So one of those comes on the land and in six months it's open. So yeah, we, we have to have, education is vital to democracy. It's vital. And if you don't invest in it, you're really going to cause a heck of a problem for the, for the generations coming up. And uh, so, yeah, we, 
I'm thrilled at what we're doing. Do we need to do more? Yeah, absolutely. This community's growing. But when you see the rate of construction here in Langley and you see those spots open up, oh, I'm just so excited. Okay, th thank you for that. Um, well, we're, we're galloping towards our time. We have time for a few more questions here. Um, in, in your writing, this past weekend in your writing, there was a fatal shooting just off 200th Street where both the shooter and the victim were known to police. Um, earlier this month, I'm sure we all saw the horrific knife attack in Vancouver where the, uh, the, the perpetrator had 60 recorded encounters with police. Um, the criminal justice system is largely a provincial jurisdiction, so as MLA, how would you propose we get the handle on this type of crime? Yeah, this is very challenging. We have, we have intersecting crises here. You know, you, there's, there's the public safety component and there's also the mental health component. We've seen an increase in, in people who are struggling with mental health crisis. Um, and because of those challenges, it once again, there is no one solution to that problem. You need to have access to mental health for people that need it. We have seen complex, uh, the opening of complex care beds in our communities because we know that when people can get better at home, closer to home in their communities, they have more success if they're able to be, um, you know, treated and able to return to the community. We know that with um, public safety, uh, we need to have options for people to get that help when you have competing challenges. We have added more opportunities for people to receive rehabilitation um, if they are um, addicted to drugs. So detox beds and rehabilitation options. We know also that, um, in, in, as you said, is largely provincial, but there are uh, you know, criminal code provisions that are federal, of course. We are working with federal counterparts to, to find solutions to some of those challenges. So that work is taking place, getting people housed, we know is the first step to making um, opportunities for people to receive the care that they need. And we also know that that mental health investment when you talk about somebody with 60 repeat offenders, you look at that and you see that it's a complex challenge. There's usually a mental health component, there is an addiction component. Getting people the help they need in their community is, is definitely the answer to those really significantly entrenched people and, um, and those, those new um, mental health beds that have opened are going to uh, be a significant portion in that multi-pronged plan. Great, thanks for that. We've, we've got one minute left in our, in our 20 minute discussion here and I wanna kind of bring it back to where, we're, where we started on the affordability and opportunity questions. And I was chatting with somebody, um, I guess last week, whose nephews are born and raised here and are off to Alberta uh, looking for opportunities there. Um, do you have anything, and because of housing, it's because of, of, of cost of living here, do you have a uh, kind of closing remark on this last question about how do we make sure that Langley remains someplace that people can, can not just raise a family, but that family then wants to stay here and, and, can, and can continue being Langley residents? Yeah, Langley is a great place to, to live. I mean, I know I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to raise my children here and, and, and farm in this community. And uh, I know that you hear numbers like that sort of anecdotally, like people have moved out of the province. But when you look at the net migration numbers, people, more people are moving here. It's a desirable place to live. British Columbia has much better weather. I grew up in Ottawa, you know, you sort of freeze to death in the dark. You know, it's a, it's a nicer place, you know. Um, but affordability is, is definitely a challenge for families. And often they're looking at having to move to, um, you know, a, a place because they're finding it hard to find uh, an affordable house. The measures that we talked about at the beginning of our conversation you know, providing opportunities for attainable housing, providing, you know, businesses opportunities where people can live closer to um, where they work. Um, the opportunities that we have um, to attract people to come and invest in British Columbia. Really, all of those together are, are the steps that need to be taken to ensure that people are going to be able to live and raise their families here in, in Langley. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we do have two minutes now for closing remarks. If you wanted to you know, wrap up anything and, or anything you wanted to add before uh, we, we uh, part for tonight. Yeah, absolutely. I just, I, I, as I mentioned in, in my opening statement, it's, it's been an absolute privilege serving as your MLA for the past four years in this community. Um, <coughs> sorry. The work that um, we've been able to do together as a community, um, investing um, in nonprofits like Langley Meals on Wheels, accessibility upgrades that have allowed them to 
um, you know, and, and make the space more accessible for, for people that benefit from those commu uh, that community space. Uh, working to build more schools, bringing more healthcare options to Langley, bringing more housing options to Langley. That is the, the work that I am I'm so proud to have been able to work with, with you on it. One thing about Langley is our community is, is so involved. And um, seeing it grow um, is exciting, but also seeing that the core fundamental that we come together to achieve great things hasn't changed as our community grows. So thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. I'm asking for your support again um, this year with, uh, f for on October 19th to have the privilege to serve you for another four years. And I encourage you, if you have any questions, to please never hesitate to reach out. So I hope you have a, whole, a wonderful rest of the night. And thanks for the chance to answer these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie, very much. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, I want to uh, move on. We're going to move on to our writing of uh, Langley Willowbrook. Uh, the, this writing includes where we are now uh, and the city of Langley and the southern portion of the township. It runs from 72nd Avenue south to 33, 36, and from 196 to about 211, 212 in, in the east. So again, Langley City and south, that's kind of where, 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 where that'll be your writing there. So um, we have a couple of candidates who are going to be running in Langley Willowbrook. I'd like to invite uh, Petrina Arneson, candidate with the BC Green Party, to join me on stage next. Thank you for being here. All right, did you want, uh, so we'll, same format, so we'll, we'll start with uh, maybe a two minutes, uh, you have two minutes there, and Bernice will we'll make sure we're on the dinger here, but two minutes and maybe give a, an introduction and your opening remarks here. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, most particularly, thank you to the audience for coming tonight. Thank you for the organizing. And thank you very much for everybody who's been here on, have, on behalf of democracy. I would say it's so critical and important. October the 19th is just around the corner. And I'm pleased to be able to be here tonight in, uh, in pursuit of being the MLA for the new riding. Um, I just want to characterize some of my thoughts about running for that particular riding. Uh, I was really excited, actually, at the thought, this is going to be, to me, the epicenter of what is happening in our local community. Langley City and the Township of Langley are going to undergo unprecedented change as a result of the SkyTrain. And so I think some people are really excited about that. Some people are full of trepidation. Some are not quite sure what to think about that for a variety of reasons. But for me, the reason I wanted to put my name forward is because I think in the duration of the time that it's taking to do the planning and put this all together, it's really important that we look in particular on the social side of what we have in our community to make sure, for example, I do a lot of work around seniors and aging issues, and I want to make sure that people that could potentially be uh, dispossessed and relocated as a result of development are not going to face those kind of challenges. I know the city has put together a new policy to double on the amount of money that people are going to be getting, but it's still not going to be enough for people who are going to have to be dispossessed. And so thank you very much again for coming, and I look forward to the uh, exciting questions I know Corey's going to ask me. Thank you. <laughs> There we go. Well, let's let's dive in then. So, yeah. um, you mentioned SkyTrain is coming. That's a, an example of a. a big ticket infrastructure uh, uh, investment in the community. Um, but communities like Langley, where we're growing so fast, Surrey has the same problem. We, we've, we've not seen the community supporting infrastructure keep up with growth. We, we, do seem, we do seem to be struggling to kind of always play catch up. Langley's expected to add 100,000 people over the next 20 years. Um, how will you as MLA be a voice to ensure Langley doesn't get left behind and gets the community supporting infrastructure investments it needs and deserves? Okay, well in two minutes, I just want to refer to my background. I was a counselor in the township of Langley for eight years, and during that time, I became really aware of the fact of how much we're going to struggle as a local government without aid and support from the province. If we are required to have so much density, people moving here were happy to have this, to be reinvigorated, to redevelopment, you know, have all of these opportunities, but at the same time, it really requires a lot of money, and that money cannot be achieved just by property taxes. It's unfair, and their burden should be shared. I remember going to a UBCM meeting where I said directly to administrators uh, 
an MLA's assistant, I said, you need to set aside monies so that we can have a formula that directs money that is going from our population increase into infrastructure. We need the certainty, and I really don't support the idea of changing zoning and density without knowing where that money is coming from. I think it's not a good business plan. I appreciate that uh, that comment and and building the sky train you mentioned some people are trepidation or, or, or concerned or have some trepidation around the sky train and, and and often that's related in in our experience from our members is around the challenges of crime and homelessness um, the riding you're running in includes Langley City which unfortunately has more than its fair share of these challenges um, residents and businesses can see this issue on display vividly on our streets and in our parks and it's increasingly on the minds of voters if we listen to the polls um, what would you do as MLA to tackle this um, and and why do you think the efforts and dollars that have been put into this so far haven't yielded the results that people are expecting. Yeah, thank you. That's a really a perplexing problem that we have. Um, I will just say, in hearkening back to my time on council, it was something that was always considered. I know the city of Langley struggles with the same. They have more visible crime, I would say, and the, the statistics will bear that out. But the township of Langley, certainly all of that, if you read the local headlines in the media, we certainly know that there are issues and more concern. That's one of the issues that was registered most with people being asked, what's your top of mind issue for the election. And it is public safety. Public safety is something that is very complicated just because we have a confluence of things that needed to be deal with. So we have mental health issues, we have homelessness, we have individuals who are subject to recidivism. Many times to hear the police chief come and say, listen, we have these people and you know they're just causing a multitude of problems, but we can't get rid of them except to try and expel them from town. You know, these these are things that we need to have more resources. This is somewhere where I think that the provincial government needs to do a better job and has done in the past since 2017 to come up with a strategy and it was a, a nonpartisan so it was a group of individuals from all parties and they made recommendations about public safety but it was never adopted so I think we need to go back to the drawing board to review this to work with the community to find out what the issues are including policing more community policing more mental health more interventions and just more wraparound services to address the problem Okay, thanks, thanks for your response on that. Um, in your, your opening comments there, I, th I think you, I picked up you mentioning talking about kind of rental displacement and, and as, as the growth comes in there. With increasing demand uh, for rental housing in the region, what me measures would you support uh, to, take, uh, to support both renters and the small-scale landlords that are required to have the units? How do we, how do we balance this, uh, this idea of affordability um, with the viability of, of, uh, of, the, of the market? Yes, that's another really good question. Um, I know that the government has been spending through policies quite a lot of effort and our taxpayer dollars on developing different levels of affordability for people that want to get into the market. So there's rental market, there's homes for the, the middle income individuals. Uh, I just really want to focus, because I haven't heard a lot about it in this campaign, about people that are elderly. I just want to point out that there is a certain sentiment that a lot of people seem to have that the elderly are very well off that there are a lot of people that just have the equity in their home and they're able to sell it and then they can get the home care or other supports that they need. There is a huge and growing percentage of individuals of non-funded senior individuals who are becoming homeless. Now, I've spent a lot of time, I work with the United Way, I'm on a board, and so provincially we discuss these things. What do we need to do to fine tune this? And the bottom line is we really need to have more units that are built of rent geared to income. So it is a formula, it's a formula we know that works, it's a formula that we used to have because when the federal government was more involved in housing in the 1980s before they decided that was no longer their interest or jurisdiction by choice, then we had this problem of all of these different complexes and people living in places that basically the, the building aged out. They didn't have money to continue and they never invested in those. So I'm really a keen supporter of doing that. It's not to the neglect or not looking at other interests, because I do think people like have young families, people who have 
other individuals that they need to look after, including themselves. We need housing for workers. We need all of those things. But I think in terms of being equitable, we really have to look at people who have invested in our community for decades that live here now and are definitely in danger of being dislocated as a result of not having these policies. Thanks for that. I'm, I'm going to pick up on, on, on you brought uh, mentioned seniors, so let's pivot to, to that topic. And, and Langley is, as I mentioned a few times, the fastest growing community in Metro Vancouver, and 37% and of the population is 65 or over. Um, and, and so our, our Langley seniors population is higher than the regional average. Um, Fraser Health has an overall shortage of 8,000 beds, and many are needed in Langley. Uh, I think most people, if they aren't seniors themselves, obviously have a senior who they love in their lives and, and, and care about this issue. So what are your thoughts on how you talked about seniors housing. How do, what are your thoughts on how to ensure Langley's growing seniors population has a place to call home when they are no longer able to live independently? Okay, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm happy to say that one of the individuals that was so instrumental in making sure that I have a place to live is in the audience tonight. So I'm just referring to the Aspire building. It came before council. It seemed like a great plan for a 55 plus building. It's near the hospital. Hospital. It's near services in a walkable community. I think this is a great model for what we need to do. But we need service providers, churches, we need the local government, anybody that has land. There are so many opportunities for these entities to line themselves up with government funding, either federal funding, provincial funding, or both. And so I look at that and say, this is a wonderful opportunity to house the approximately 30% of seniors that are going to be living in our community. And I'm just really, really very distressed when I deal with people that I know that have to talk to seniors every day that come crying to the Langley Senior Resource Center and absolute just panic because they know that their building is not going to be able to accommodate them anymore. Why? Because it's being redeveloped, it's being consolidated. And these are understandable things. This is what's happening. But we have to be more proactive to make sure that that doesn't happen to individuals. And I certainly know, you know, a lot of people, your mental health, your ability to stay in a community, aging in place, these are all things that need to be addressed by your housing strategy. It has to be holistic. You can't take people and stick them out somewhere outside of the community where they don't have any services, particularly seniors who can't drive. And let's be honest, there is a transportation issue in the township of Langley for seniors especially individuals who are no longer able to drive. Uh, thank you, Petrina. You, 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 you mentioned, and I wanted to ask you this, you mentioned your experience on, on township council and, and working with, with at the municipal level. Um, what do you think that will bring in your role as MLA, that experience? How will that come to bear on, on what you're able to do as an MLA? Yeah. Well, there's nothing like on-the-job experience, I would say to dictate to yourself, gee, if I was in that position, this is what I could do. So first of all, what I would say is, my biggest objective, if I was to become an MLA, is to right away consider how can we collaborate with our senior level of government. If anybody knows about the community charter, we are historically known as local government, as a child of the province, and so there are many different challenges that we have to raise funds, to be able to be more autonomous, and to figure out how this growing gap can be achieved of the disparity between the money that we have to work with for property taxes and what we need to build out and to provide services. These are legitimate services that need to be addressed. But I'm a collaborative person. I would say, more than anything, how you get things done on government is to be part of a team that looks at the problem and comes at it from different points of view. To me, that's the most democratic and positive thing to do. Any homogenous group who thinks that groupthink is a good idea is really missing the mark. You need to have a bunch of different opinions, people that are willing to be open, to collaborate, to listen, and I think that my experience on council really would uh, suggest that I, I'm quite good at that. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, today, the community of Grand Forks remains on evacuation alert due to a nearby forest fire. Um, and while we had a bit of a moderate summer here, it was named uh, the hottest ever recorded for the Northern Hemisphere this last summer. Um, but with affordability, housing, other concerns front of mind, the environment and climate doesn't seem to have been kind of reached the fore of this election yet. Um, what are your thoughts on how much of a priority this ought to be for the next government? And what would you do as an MLA uh, to champion climate and environment? 
Thank you for this most important question. I would have to say to characterize the different entities that are running. So there's people that are independent, there's the formal parties, and the Green Party, I believe, is the most consistent in their uh, objective of putting the environment first. So having been the person on Langley Township Council that brought the climate emergency declaration to the township, I could say that it is something that is one of my prouder moments in my political history. And I think that the province and this election period has really shone a light on the differences between the parties when it comes to what initiatives, what objectives, and how they will prioritize the climate. I have used this argument many times and oftentimes an economic argument is equally compelling as to a values argument. Every dollar that is spent on climate mitigation will save three to five in terms of flooding, fires, and any other kind of thing that can be caused by climate change. So I certainly think in terms of a valuable investment, this is something that we need to look at continue to prioritize and not fall back on these ideas that it's somebody else's problem, they need to do it first. We all have to play a role. Thanks for your input on that. Uh, I want to kind of move to into our, our jobs in the economy and cost of living categories here. And, huh? and I, I told the... Um, can I, <laughs> there we go. I could have, I could have opened okay. it for you. Sorry about that. It was my fault for squeezing it <laughs> at the same time. The... Um, I mentioned the, the, the anecdote earlier about um, the person whose nephew is, is, is leaving, and, and on, on a business side, we're seeing that too. Um, we've had three of our members of the chamber who have left the chamber. Two are heading, their, moving their businesses to Calgary. One's moved their business to Vancouver Island. What are you going to do as an MLA to make BC and Langley a place where people can afford to stay and build a life, build a business, and build a family here? Yes, thank you for that. Well, actually, I've been digging a bit into that. I know that the Chamber has done a lot of work, the BC Chamber and our local Chamber, to talk and take the stakeholders, the people in our community, the construction industry, the workers, the service industry, people that work in hospitals and take care of us, all of those individuals, they are critical to our ability to have a community so that we can live here. And the common denominator for all of those individuals, even for relatively high income earners, is the fact that it is very expensive to live here. And to get into the why would take too long. But how to address that problem? It means that we all have to look at each and every single policy that we have and review it for the purpose of considering, are these costs too high? What about all of these additions that we're making? Some of them need to be maybe scaled back somewhat. You know, to me, this is uh, what needs to happen. If you have a policy that you've developed and you're working to try and figure out, is this the best for our community? You have to have a mechanism to know at a certain point, within a year or so, how is it working? Is it effective? Is it causing people to leave our province? Nobody wants people to leave our province. However many people are coming here, I know there are people leaving. And so the other thing we need to do is to make sure that we have more jobs for people. We have to have good jobs. I look at this community and say, we need to have more green jobs, for example. We need to have new industries come here. We need the hydrogen industry to come here. We need industries that are considered to be ones that will really help to move us forward in our climate objectives as well. Uh, th thanks for that. And, and let's p kind of pick up what you're talking about uh, jobs. Let's pick up on the economy. Um, I guess now former finance minister Katrine Conroy recently announced the deficit for this year is forecast to be $8.9 billion, the largest ever. Do, do you, do the Greens, have concerns with the level, level of deficit spending? And do you believe there needs to be a plan to balance the budget? My time is running. I'm taking a deep breath. <laughs> um, I, I really think this needs to be more top of mind. I know certainly I have read so many articles from the business community talking about the debt 
that we have. And I understand the balance that we have. We need to grow, we need to build. There's been a long delay in making sure that the infrastructure that we need has actually been developed. And that's a problem because it is very expensive now. And so this is not to say we need to curtail that, but I really think this is a perfect inflection point to look at our debt and to find out what is our strategy. Are we just going to have endless debt? I can relate this to the, the Township of Langley and other local governments. We cannot have an endless debt. There are limits to this. And so I believe that the Green Party would feel the more that we have debt, the more we imperil ourselves because the very thing that's helping us to grow is also undermining our ability to pay for social services. Because that interest rate is not going down, it's not zero anymore. It's a very expensive thing and it continues to accrue uh, if there is no management of that. So I'd say definitely the Greens. I'm a politically uh, and economically conservative person, which might seem kind of an oxymoron to be a Green, but I do think that we need to have that conversation. Uh, Thanks for that. You, you mentioned in your, your previous comment the idea of we need to bring hydrogen jobs here and, and green jobs. Um, a lot of that takes training. Something that we continue to hear about at the, challenge, at the chamber is the challenge newcomers have in getting their international training and credentials recognized and being able to contribute to the economy and take those jobs. Uh, what do you think needs to be done to help people in, the, in fields like the trades, engineering, healthcare, get into the jobs they're trained to do? Thank you very much for that. Well, most recently, the local Langley Immigration Partnership and the Chamber of Commerce put together a very valuable workshop that I attended, and I happened to go to the evening where they had highly skilled individuals that came from around the world. I think most of them were engineers, and I was there sort of like wallpaper to hear their stories and what was going on. And what I heard, and they were paired up with different business owners in the community that need to have skilled workers. And what's missing in this component is we need to have a, a lot more ability to fine tune and change the accreditation. There's been a lot of discussion about that. People who come to our country, and even when I was younger in law school, I stood in line for financial aid with people who were trained lawyers from other countries and judges who drove you know, pizza vehicles. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but we need so many individuals. Well, there is something wrong with that when you get that kind of education and that's what we're missing. And I can't help but notice we're sitting in KPU. It has a huge capacity to be an area, I think, where we can grow and develop uh, the kind of training and skill set that we need to have for people that are coming to our community. I think that you know immigration, we're setting different standards for people. We want people to come here who have a skill set, but we are missing the mark when we're not looking at how it is that we can employ them and get them to be part of our community and help us with the deficiencies that we have with the employment areas. It's just, you know, skilled doctors, skilled lawyers, skilled engineers, yeah. Well, thanks for that, and, and, and we're, we're coming up on our, our, our conversation time here, so again, I'm going to loop it back to what is the top issue here, which is cost of living and affordability, and, and some of these issues, I, energy costs, those are influenced by global events. Interest rates are set independently by the Bank of Canada. There's no, we don't have price controls on, on the groceries. So really, what, what can you do as an MLA? What, what can the Green Party do in, in the legislature to help make life affordable for the people who are here today? Um, to be honest, I think that there have been a lot of initiatives to help people. I think my biggest complaint about government, although I don't think it's it's not surmountable, is that there's always a time delay in between when something happens and the policies that come to rectify them. If government could be more proactive, I would definitely say, you know, to work more with industry, for example, to, to find out ways to help them to streamline the process. We cannot build if they can't afford to have uh, the, the building that they need to have done. They need to have skilled workers, they need to have a set of objectives they can understand, has to be stable, it has to be something that makes sense from their business point of view. Certainly had lots of conversations with developers to know what their needs are. And so I think absent that, we really can't expect 
that our community can grow in a way that we need it to grow. If we're going to build ourselves out, and as you alluded to, Willowbrook itself, with the new SkyTrain station and having the 200th Street corridor, you're going to have another 100,000 people there. We have to be extremely proactive to make sure as Megan mentioned, I think, to have really a diversity of options for people. We need to have uh, places where people can live. We can't have firefighters and people living outside of our community where we're most vulnerable, have situations come up and they have to drive over the bridge. You know, so we really need to work to manage that. And it takes an awful, awful lot of effort and I think it takes a lot of collaboration to come up with those strategies because politically speaking, I think we need to bring everybody together for that kind of conversation to be effective. Thank you very much, Petrina. Uh, we have time now for some closing remarks. We'd like to, to share um, any, any final comments with the audience and, and the, the, the viewers as well. I can't believe how fast the time went. <laughs> Seems like the last four years just whizzed right by. Uh, I just want to, again, thank everybody for coming and for your attention tonight. And I want to thank Corey for his really great questions. I, I think that this was a really wonderful way to make sure that people had an exposure to at least some of the candidates that are presenting themselves for this event tonight. Um, I, I really sincerely hope that you will consider a green vote. I just want to say that for me this is not a binary election. I see all the time in the media that it's the Conservatives and the NDP as if it's a wasteland with nothing else in between. I think that we need to look at individuals who have principles, character, education, and experience to bring this home, to represent the community that a person like myself for more than 20 years, I've looked after my parents here, I've lived here, and I've helped to govern. So I think that those are really important things to consider when looking at the ballot on October the 19th, or if you mail it in before that, just to consider. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Katrina. Uh, and I'd like to now uh, move on to uh, our second candidate in the langley Willowbrook riding, uh, Andrew Mercier, candidate with the BC NDP, to come uh, join me on stage here. You can have that one. Well, thank you for taking the time to be here tonight. Did you want, uh, we have two minutes, did you want to take a little bit of a chance to uh, opening remarks and introduce yourself to the audience here? Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Corey. So I'm Andrew Mercy, I'm the BC NDP candidate here in uh, Langley, Willowbrook. And I'd like to also acknowledge we're on the traditional territory of the Katsi, Matsqui, and Semiamu um, First and Kwantlen First Nations. Uh, and, you know, I just want to say, and I want to echo uh, my friend Megan Dykeman and just say what an honor and a privilege it's been for the last four years to be one of the MLAs for Langley and the ML uh, and you know running for MLA for um, for Langley Willowbrook, you know as someone that was raised in Langley, I grew up on two, between 200 A Street and uh, and Murrayville. Um, I don't think there is a better honor than to have the opportunity to represent your hometown in the legislature. And what a cool thing that that has been. And there have been, and there are, significant challenges facing the province right now. And there are significant challenges that are happening in Langley. We see challenges on housing, on health care, on education. But we have been able to move the dial forward on so many things in the past four years. You look at, and because of the advocacy of my friend um, Megan Dykeman, the schools on the Willoughby Slope that are slated, that are going in, being expanded, Richard Bullpit, which was announced, and six months later, the expansion is completed. In record time, the, um, you know, the expansions at LSS, Ari Mountain, Nickel Meckle, we are moving the dial on education here in Langley, and we are moving the dial on health with a brand new hospital and you can think of it as a Surrey hospital, I think of it as a Langley hospital, but a brand new hospital in Cloverdale, right behind the KPU Trades Campus, right off the bypass, that's going to serve the Langley area, as well as a 300-bed long-term care center right here at the hospital. So there's a, lot, there's a lot that we've done, a lot we've been working on, there's a lot more to do, and I'm hoping to get into that with you over the course of, uh, the, course of the next 20 minutes, Corey. Awesome. Well, let, let's dive in then. Um, let's, why don't we start with our housing and infrastructure category. This afternoon, I was speaking with CBC News about the new report from the Mayor's Council about the $600 million deficit, $600 million deficit at TransLink and the looming service cuts if nothing is done to bridge that. Um, Langley gets wiped off the TransLink map if we don't get uh, anything to solve the transit shortfall. So what's 
Judge, uh, what is your position? What's, what's uh, the NDP position on transit in general, but also how do we solve this gap that TransLink has exposed for everybody? Yeah, and so transportation is critical, and it's critical in a growing community like Langley. And so, you know, and it's, you can see for, uh, for us as government and for myself as MLA and for Megan, the work we've done on transportation in this area, right? We've pushed forward the SkyTrain project, which the tender is complete. You can go down Fraser Highway and see the advanced works happening right now, um, which is, as someone that grew up here, an incredible transformation to watch. But you know, there are also, there's also a reality coming through the pandemic with TransLink of a real decline in ridership. It's happened across North America and across the globe. British Columbia has had the fastest rebound in transit ridership of any jurisdiction in North America. And it's because we've been there supporting TransLink and supporting uh, transportation along the way. And that's meant that temporary bridge funding of several hundred million dollars to TransLink to keep it going while we can sit down and have these conversations um, with the mayors. Because there are, you know, like uh, any kind of shared policy um, issues that need to be sat down and worked through to come to an arrangement. But, you know, I would say we're committed to working through those and to making sure that tra transit is funded in a stable and ongoing manner. Uh, thanks for that. You, you, you mentioned the SkyTrain, you mentioned the, the, the Cloverdale slash Langley Hospital. Um, that, that, that project is over budget and, and uh, delayed. The SkyTrain was just delayed by a year and $2 billion. Do you have any comment on what uh, is going on with the infrastructure projects that have been announced but are taking longer and costing more to get uh, actually operational for people to use? Yeah, and I think those are good. Those are really great questions, Corey. And so there's a lot of things that are going on in terms of the estimation of projects and where projects come in in tender. And when you look at a project that was estimated at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, and you get past the post-pandemic reality, and you see a lot of the assumptions have changed pretty dramatically. Inflation has gone up. Supply change and material supply. Um, as I'm sure a lot of your members have noticed, have really uh, been in a crunch point. But there's also a real crunch for skilled labor. In the next 10 years, we need 83,000 skilled tradespeople in British Columbia. 67% of that is due, to, um, is due to retirements, and the rest is due to new construction, new infrastructure, plans for new projects. And so we need to make sure that we're there supporting that so that we can get projects built on time, but we also need to have those projects to be there to train the next generation, which is why we're committed to that infrastructure, but we're also committed to doubling the, uh, doubling the amount of apprenticeship that happens in this province. That's an announcement we made today that we will double the amount of apprenticeship seats because, and I'll tell you right now, if you have a young person in your life, you couldn't tell them to do something better than to get into the trades because on the one hand, you look at it as a skilled work crisis, on the other hand, that's someone that's going to have uh, employment throughout the course. Uh, I appreciate that. And, and, and a lot of those trades are going to be working in the housing sector. Um, so why don't we look at, at, at that here. Um, we can't solve the housing shortage without building housing. Um, how do you think the government should work with the development community in the Fraser Valley, which is largely disincentivized from building right now? There's some tough math on projects to, to make them viable, uh, to ensure that the housing supply that we actually need gets built. Because um, it's one thing to have dollars and programs, but unless we're getting nails and boards, we're not getting any of the housing that we need. Yeah, absolutely. And that's been a real problem in terms of rising interest rates as well. The, uh, what we need to do is get people into homes. We need homes, uh, we need homes that are being built and we need to work with the home building community to do that. And partly through removing barriers uh, in terms of getting projects through the pipeline and into construction. But also a real advantage that the government of British Columbia has is financing. We have a triple, we're the only province in Canada that has a triple A credit rating, which means that we can borrow money to fund programs for home building and to get people into homes um, at a rate that's just not available in the private market. And so we need to look at innovative partnerships, innovative partnerships to get that housing built. Now, BC Builds, so it was mentioned by my, uh, by my friend Megan, is a, is a very important one where we work with communities uh, and we work with, um, we work with nonprofits and other organizations to identify underutilized land, right, that we can get, uh, that we can get folks into, we can get projects built on, 
um, that works for everyone. But we also need to look at other potential, other potential solutions. And I'm really excited about the Heather Lands project with the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh that was announced, which is a, um, a government-backed uh, government financing arrangement that would see folks, uh, see folks covering 60% of the market cost and allow them to get in to the project, and it's self-sustaining internal financing. So we have to be creative, we have to be innovative, but we also have to work with the sectors so we're doing what works. Uh, just picking up on, on the, so we're continuing on the housing, the housing theme, your government has uh, passed in November a series of pretty bold housing uh, statutes, which has seen some pushback at the local level on, on the impact it's going to have in communities like Langley that are growing very fast, but there's going to be a requirement for them to, to grow denser, grow more in certain areas. How, what's, that, what's the balance that you, want, that you think we should be striking between um, getting the housing that we need, but making sure the infrastructure is in place, and then respecting the communities that people have, have moved to and built uh, in, in wherever they live? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. Over the past four years, and even during this election campaign, I haven't talked to a single person that hasn't brought up with me the need for more housing and the need for more housing in Langley. And, you know, I, uh, I feel it acutely. I'm, I'm a renter. Um, and it's probably the biggest challenge facing us. And like any big challenge or crisis, public safety, healthcare, um, housing, I haven't spoken to anybody that said to me, uh, you know, well, this is this level of government's responsibility. People want solutions to the issue. So what we've looked at is we've looked at a series of measures that in the aggregate, that in the aggregate, will help with housing affordability. Now the statutes you mentioned, the laws you mentioned that remove barriers to get gentle density and multifamily built are a major part of that. Transit-oriented development's a major part of that. Removing speculation from the housing market's a major part of that. Regulating Airbnbs, right, uh, is a major part of that because homes are for people. Um, and so we need, to, we need to make sure we're focused on that like a laser uh, and across, uh, across the whole spectrum of public policy when it comes to housing. It is the issue of our time. Uh, thanks for that. I want, I want to move into the community health and safety segment or, or, or topics here. And I mentioned earlier that, that horrific attack in Vancouver where the person had 60 recorded encounters with police, very well known. I hear from my, my members, uh, whether they're on, on the one way in your riding or they're in, in Walnut Grove or they're in Alder Grove, it doesn't matter where they are, they get frustrated when they see a, a broken window and it's the same person that they saw last week break the window down the street. And we seem to see the same folks kind of going through the motions here, and, and um, they're known to police, and we don't seem to be able to break that cycle. As, as, as MLA, and over the last four years, and, and, and if you get reelected, what do you, how do you propose we, we break that cycle? How do we get our handle on this kind of repeat offender, low-grade grinding crime that we're seeing on the streets, and, and, and not just in the downtown east side now, it, it's everywhere across the province? It, everyone deserves to feel safe in their community, Corey, and I think what you're asking is really two different um, sets of issues, which is repeat offenders and sometimes violent repeat offenders, and also then those um, street entrenched folks who have um, you know, sometimes profound substance use, mental health issues, and acquired brain injury. And we need to deal with the two and deal with strategies that are appropriate for those problems. And so in terms of repeat offenders, we have advocated to the federal government in terms of bail reform, that bail reform needs to happen so that if someone is violent, they are not let out on the, on the street while they are awaiting sentencing or while they are awaiting trial. And that's a key uh, piece of advocacy that we have had to do, that David Eby has gone to Ottawa multiple times to try to push. But we also need to make sure that we're supporting police. We have some of the best community RCMP officers in the province working here in Langley. Um, they're community-minded, they're public safety-minded, and they are sometimes a bridge between so many different service providers. So we need to make sure we're supporting them by working with them on managing repeat offenders um, and working with, uh, working with parole officers, social workers, and everyone else, but then also making sure we're there on the mental health and addiction side. Um, so one, uh, one uh, team we funded in Langley is the Forensic Assertive Community-Based Treatment Team, which is a team of forensic mental health professionals that work with folks that have both substance use issues and acquired brain injuries. So if you're on synthetic opioids or stimulants, crystal meth, fentanyl, um, and you have, a, uh, you have a synthetic brain or you have a brain injury from overdose, but also other mental health issues, there's a team of 
mental health professionals with experience in the criminal justice system there to help manage that and to get folks off the street. It's a complicated problem, but that doesn't mean we should shy away from it. Uh, and, and I guess you mentioned kind of the, the health care, the health impacts of, of, on that issue. So let's talk about health in, 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 in general. We're seeing, um, and Langley thankfully hasn't seen too much of this, but in, in other communities we're seeing the ER shut down over weekends. We're seeing uh, hospital waits uh, that we have seen in Langley, 12 hours to get to the ER when they are open. What are, what's, your, what's your government done and what will you do uh, if reelected to make sure that when people turn up at the, uh, at the hospital or they turn up at urgent care that there's someone to see them and that they can get care in a timely manner? Healthcare is one of the single most important issues facing British Columbians and you need to know that you've got a doctor, that you've got a nurse, that you've got care there when you need it. About 18 months ago, last summer, Megan and I went up to the hospital with Adrian Dix and we spent eight hours there sitting down with all of the different um, all of the different groups of staff in the hospital. We met with the hospitalists, the ER qualified nurses, the, uh, we met with management, we met with the clerks, we met with the imaging techs. Text. And we ask the same question, what will help with patient flow? What are the actual problems you're facing? And we heard it, CT scanning, the imaging scanning is a bottleneck. So add a CT scanner in community and urgent primary care and we can get people through faster. But the single biggest thing we heard, the single biggest thing was the need for more long-term care and that in fact, a lack of long-term care is a patient flow issue with folks in acute care who ought to be in long-term care, which is why I'm proud of the fact that uh, you know, Megan and I were able to go and announce with some other colleagues I see in the, in the room from various uh, community organizations, a new long-term care project in Langley at Langley Memorial Hospital of 300 beds, single room, uh, single room occupancy so folks can spend their days there in dignity. Um, and, that, uh, and that frankly is the most significant investment in that hospital probably since it was built. I'm going to move, move on to our jobs and economy and cost of living categories. And, and um, I did ask this question or a, 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 a take on this question earlier, and it probably should be one that, that you get. So um, uh, international credentials. Uh, what does your government do on this file? Given that we've heard these complaints from newcomers last week, um, what, needs, what more needs to be done then uh, to make sure that when we're welcoming the world here, people are, are traveling all the way from wherever they're coming to here, that they're not then landing and realizing, oh, I can't be the engineer I, I was back home, I can't be the nurse I was back home. What, uh, what if given another term, what would, would your government do to solve that? Yes, I, I'm proud to be part of a government that's a leader on this nationally. And so engineering is a good example. So. In, uh, in my role as Minister of State for Workforce Development, I introduced the International Credential Recognition Act, removing barriers for internationally trained professionals, and the amount of barriers in place uh, for me after I went through engagement with community was striking. I'll never forget, you mentioned engineers, I'll never forget talking to an Iranian engineer who had 20 years of engineering experience in Iran. And he told me, he said he's a qualified engineer now, and he told me his story and he said he went through, he drove a taxi, he delivered pizza, um, he did odd jobs to support his family. Well, he went through a very onerous process and what he said is the same thing I've heard from every internationally credentialed professional. If I have to do more, I'll do more, but this doesn't make sense. Uh, he got to the end of the process and he was told, you need to go get Canadian work experience. Your education's fine, you need to get Canadian work experience. We'll try finding an engineer who will take you on, you're a liability, and getting a wage you can support a family on. And he cried and he told me, he told me um, his 20 years of experience in Iran wasn't worth one day in Canada. And so I'm proud to say we introduced legislation banning Canadian work experience requirements and banning a lot of, frankly, unfair barriers for immigrant professionals. There's more work to do and there's more work we need to do on the health front. Um, and if we're re-elected, we're going to introduce immediate provisional licenses for doctors and nurses trained in other parts of Canada. But if you're in a globally comparable jurisdiction coming to Canada, we're going to give you those licenses within six weeks. So there's big things that we, we have done. There's big things that we can do. Okay, thanks for that. Um, a recent opinion poll that was conducted for the BC Chamber of Commerce showed that more than 60% of British Columbians believe a strong economy is required to pay for the, the public services that we all want. Um, what would you say will be the priorities and policies you'll fight for as MLA if you're re-elected to support the job creation, economic growth that we need to underpin and pay for all the other promises and, and, and plans that will be announced during the campaign? 
Yeah, and so, so supporting economic growth is absolutely critical. And we heard ex an example about the Manufacturing Jobs Fund. And I think forestry is a good example. So we have the Manufacturing Jobs Fund in British Columbia. It's a $180 million fund. 70 million of that goes to forestry. You wouldn't think of Langley as a forest-dependent community. The reality is we're a forest-dependent province and that 50% of manufacturing and forestry happens in the Lower Mainland. You just have to drive through Port Kells to see that. That fund, that 70 million spent on forestry, has unlocked $500 million in capital because it allows a company to go to the bank and to use that to borrow to expand their operations and create employment. So SNR Sawmills got $4 million. They were able to leverage that into significantly more and expand one of their lines, creating employment. We also need to make sure that we have the projects that are there and happening um, for tradespeople and construction workers. SkyTrain is going to create 4,000 direct jobs. That's to say nothing of the indirect jobs through material supply um, and other business-to-business -business relationships that are going to be created. So I'm very excited on that front that there's a lot, uh, there's a lot there and a lot to do. And, and, and that's, one, that's, that's one program that I've, I know has had some impact uh, directly here in Langley. For businesses writ large, who maybe aren't manufacturers then, um, they're experiencing lots of operational costs, taxes, rents, materials rising rapidly, labor costs have been pushed to new records. Um, what would you do with MLA to make it easier for Langley's small business community to thrive in an increasingly expensive environment? Well, and I think the answer to that, Corey, has been what my experience has been with you and with Megan over this period of time, which is to sit down with the chamber and to have these conversations. And we've had many conversations, you and me and Megan and others, about um, the employer health tax and the threshold exemption for the tax for small businesses. And so in the last budget, we doubled that threshold exemption. So 90% of businesses don't pay that tax. But we did that you know, as a consequence of the advocacy of the chamber and of those relationships. So if re-elected, um, you know, we'll continue to have those relationships. We'll continue to be open to the chamber, to your members, and to the community um, so that we can take those voices back to Victoria. We're, we're uh, coming up towards the end of our time. Here does go by fast, doesn't it? The, um, the, the, one, I, one of the biggest... Uh, cost pressures on people, anyone, anyone going about now is, is, is the interest rates, and you don't control that. That's coming from the Bank, the bank of Canada. Um, a lot of these things that are, that are driving up food prices are global supply chain challenges. Um, what, what, is it, what, 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 is it, what is in your remit? What do you have your hands on as an MLA or, or if you're reelected that you could do to make something more affordable for the people in this room? You know, cost of living and making sure that folks uh, can get by and get through the day and where we can take something off of people's plate we are going to do that. And I look at childcare. One of the biggest changes over the last several years has been the build out of universal childcare. We've been able to take the cost of childcare across the board down by 50% for folks, well building out. That is, if you have children under five, that is significant. That is significant. But we also need to make sure that where we do have control as a province, where we're taking, uh, we're taking those steps, which is why we've fixed ICBC in terms of the financial uh, situation for ICBC. The previous government was taking money out of it to roll into general revenue. We passed a law saying you can't put your hand into the cookie jar um, and that uh, revenue stays within the corporation, but that if there is, if there is a, a profit or an excess, that that goes back to policyholders through rebates. So we've been able to put money back into people's pockets through ICBC rebates and by keeping the cost of insurance low as well as looking at BC Hydro, looking at, uh, looking at building out more housing, because the number one cost of living issue that I hear from folks in Langley, frankly, is housing. And so we need to continue forward with the housing plan, and we need to continue building and building out housing at every level uh, that we can. Awesome. Uh Thank you, Andrew. We have time now for uh, uh, your closing remarks. Anything you want to leave, leave the audience with, leave the, the viewers with uh, as we wrap up tonight? Well, well, I just want to thank everybody for coming out. And in particular, I want to thank you, Corey, the Chamber. I want to thank the Real Estate Board. And I want to thank KPU uh, for the space, but also the community. Because ultimately, um, and I was saying this to, to Frank Buckholz earlier, the, uh, but ultimately, elections are about community. And when you're running for office, you get to see your community in a really cool way that most people don't get to see. And so I want to thank everyone here for coming out and for participating. I hope over the course of uh, this 20, 25-ish minutes that, um, that I've earned your consideration 
and uh, and you know it's been an honor and a privilege, uh, and I look forward uh, I look forward to the next uh, 22 days. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> You've heard from the candidates here today. Um, Please, uh, uh, thank, again, thank you to them for taking the time to join us. Thank you for, for taking the time to be here. Remember, Election Day is on October 19th. Uh, online and telephone voter registration, meaning to register to vote, closes on October 7th. You can still register on, on, uh, on voting day, but it just makes it a bit of a longer term, uh, longer time. And then advanced voting. If you, don't, if you aren't going to be able to vote on October 19th, advanced voting is on October 10th to 13th, and again, 15th to 16th. So Election BC has all the locations of where you can cast your ballot. Um, the recordings of these interviews tonight will be, uh, will be shared on the Langley Chamber's website and our YouTube channel as soon as they're ready. Um, so, but again, uh, please give me one more round of applause to our candidates for taking the time to join us here tonight. But um, on behalf of the chamber, thanks so much for being here. Oh, and we do have some, perfect. Well, then, uh, before I before I completely let you out, out of here, I did want to. Sunny Handel is the board member with the Fraser Valley Real Estate Board, a great partner of the chamber. Just wanted to give you a chance to say maybe a few words of closing now as we wrap up tonight's uh, event. Sunny, over to you. Thanks, Rui. Uh, good evening, everyone. Sorry. <clears throat> I am uh, Sunny Handel, and on behalf of uh, Fraser Valley Real Estate Board, I would like to uh, say we are pleased to sponsor this event. And uh, uh, just a bit about the board. Fraser Valley Real Estate Board represents 5,200 members and counting. We live in Fraser Valley communities, and we represent municipalities from North Delta, Surrey, White Rock, Township of Langley, City of Langley, Abbots Road, and Mission. We, the realtors, advise, guide, and protect our clients, home buyers, and the sellers. The board ensures we, are, we have all the tools to help and support our clients through uh, the process uh, which can be, uh, which could be one of the most substantial decisions in their lives. The board also ensures that we uphold the standards of our profession by providing us ongoing training, education, and development. And the latest uh, data and analytics for the areas we work in. I have some uh, latest uh, numbers for Langley and I would like to share it quickly. While the number, uh, the number of homes for sale across Fraser Valley has been steadily rising since uh, the spring this year, Langley has seen townhouse listings skyrocket year over year up 84%. And, uh, but Langley isn't immune to the uh, drop in sales across Fraser Valley, so it's no surprise inventory is building and sales are dropping. But, however, uh, the, the townhouse sales have decreased 40% month over month and 18% year over year. As for the prices, while many areas in Fraser Valley have seen benchmark prices drop, in Langley, however, prices have increased. In past year, uh, detached homes have gone up 1.2%, townhouses has gone up 2.6%. And if somebody here has bought a home in Langley in the last five years, uh, your benchmark prices are probably 50 to 60% higher than, the, than when you bought it. And uh, turning back to tonight's uh, event, Elections are an important uh, time when we as a citizens get to cast a vote and elect officials who we entrust will ensure they can be our voice for creating healthy, vibrant communities where we can live, earn, grow and play. And uh, in the lead to the provincial election this year on October 19th, Fraser Valley Real Estate Board commissioned a voter intention survey via Mustel Group. And when residents of Township of Langley and City of Langley were asked what they think are the most important provincial issues, 
Langley residents responded by saying the top three issues. The first one, cost of living, inflation was number one at 72%. Housing affordability was next at 63%. And uh, healthcare came at 40%. So in the end, I would like to thank Greater Langley Commerce, uh, Chamber of Commerce for the opportunity and uh, good luck to all the candidates. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sunny. Thank you all very much. I don't know if it's still pouring out there, but drive safe if you're uh, heading home after this or, or to, to transit safe and stay dry and uh, all the best. Take care. <laughs>